The Good Master by Kate Sarity. Chapter 9 Strange Waters. The yellow ducklings and fuzzy lemon colored chickens had lost their fluffy down. Now they were gawky, awkward little creatures. Real new feathers were growing slowly, giving them a very untidy appearance. Kate's garden was full of sturdy green plants. Some of them even had buds. Mother found fresh string beans and peas and picked a whole basket full one morning. There were many small green apples on the tree, pulling down on the branches until father propped them up with long sticks. Rabbits played in the cornfield. They were as saucy and fresh as only rabbits can be, knowing perhaps that the corn was high enough now to hide them safely. Kate loved to sit near the edge of the field, waiting for the little rascals to venture out. She would be quieter than a mouse, watching the amusing hop, skip, and jump of baby rabbits. Mother and father called them pests and nuisances because they ate fresh lettuce and radishes, but Kate loved them. They can have my share, she said. Long-necked young storks clambered in their nest on the chimney. Baby swallows cried for more and more food, keeping the old swallows busy all day. The summer wore on. In the daytime, it was blindingly, cruelly hot. The nights were sultry. Only the house, with its two-foot-thick walls and wide, shady porches, stayed cool. For weeks it had not rained. The earth was dry and cracked. The brook dried up, leaving only a wide clay bed full of cracks with a small trickle of muddy water in the middle of it. To keep the flower gardens well watered was hard work now, and even Kate's strong, sturdy little back ached sometimes. Mother gave up trying to water her flowers. She had enough to do to keep the vegetables from wilting. Kate took care of her flowers too, as she couldn't bear to see them go thirsty, drooping sadly toward the ground. Father was beginning to look very worried. If rain did not come soon, wheat and rye would go to waste. Pastures would dry up, leaving the animals hungry. He didn't take Jancy and Kate with him now where he was riding. You two stay here and help Mother. It's very hard for her these hot days. Even the sunrise wasn't beautiful now. The sun came up orange-colored, sultry, flooding the parched countryside with heat. More heat. In church, the priest prayed for rain. People came out after services just to see the same unbroken, bluish-white, blazing sky above and went home dejectedly. Hot winds drove clouds of loose dirt over everything, leaving the plains under a blanket of choking white dust. One evening, the family gathered on the porch. It had been the hottest day yet. Even the well was drying up. Father sat stooped forward, his elbows on his knees, head buried in his hands. If this drought does not break, I'm ruined, he said in a low voice. Kate and Jancy were whispering in the corner. They came forward now. Jancy touched Father on the shoulder. Father! What is it, son? We, Kate and I, have been thinking. Please don't worry so, Father. Look, we'll help you. Here's the money you gave us for this month. Father held out his hands, but he didn't take the money. He pulled Kate and Jancy very close to him. He smiled for the first time in weeks, a happy smile. Thank you, children, he said. I don't think I'll need the money just now, but I thank you. You have helped me more than you know. I won't worry anymore. As long as I can have you and mother, I have the greatest gifts life can give a man. He turned to mother. We won't worry anymore, mother. Tell us one of your funny stories now before we go to bed. A very funny one, mother, please, to make father laugh, said Jancy. Well then, I'll tell you the story of the little rooster and the Turkish sultan. Somewhere, someplace, beyond the seven seas, there lived a poor old woman. The poor old woman had a little rooster. One day, the little rooster walked out of the yard to look for strange bugs and worms. All the bugs and worms in the yard were his friends. He was hungry, but he could not eat his friends. So he walked out to the road. He scratched and he scratched. He scratched out a diamond button. Of all things, a diamond button. The button twinkled at him. Pick me up, little rooster, and take me to your old mistress. She likes diamond buttons. cock a doodle -doo. I'll pick you up and take you to my poor old mistress. So he picked up the button. Just then, the Turkish sultan walked by. The Turkish sultan was very, very fat. Three fat servants walked behind him, carrying the wide, wide bag of the Turkish sultan's trousers. He saw the little rooster with a diamond button. Little rooster, give me your diamond button. No, indeed I won't. I'm going to give it to my poor old mistress. She likes diamond buttons. But the Turkish Sultan liked diamond buttons too. Besides, he could not take no for an answer. 
he turned to his three fat servants. Catch the little rooster and take the diamond button from him. The three fat servants dropped the wide, wide bag of the Turkish Sultan's trousers, caught the little rooster, and took the diamond button away from him. The Turkish Sultan took the diamond button home with him and put it in his treasure chamber. The little rooster was very angry. He went to the palace of the Turkish Sultan, perched on the window, and cried, cock a doodle doo Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkish Sultan did not like this, so he walked into another room. The little rooster perched on the window of another room and cried, cock a doodle doo Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkish Sultan was mad. He called his three fat servants. Catch the little rooster, throw him into the well, and let him drown. The three fat servants caught the little rooster and threw him into the well. But the little rooster cried, Come, my empty stomach, come, my empty stomach, drink up all the water. His empty stomach drank up all the water. The little rooster flew back to the window and cried, cock a doodle doo Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkish Sultan was madder than before. He called his three fat servants, catch the little rooster and throw him into the fire and let him burn. The three fat servants caught the little rooster and threw him into the fire. But the little rooster cried, Come, my full stomach, let out all the water to put out all the fire. His full stomach let out all the water and it put out all the fire. He flew back to the window again and cried, cock a doodle doo Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkish Sultan was madder than ever. He called his three fat servants. Catch the little rooster, throw him into a beehive, and let the bees sting him. The three fat servants caught the little rooster and threw him into a beehive. But the little rooster cried, Come, my empty stomach, come, my empty stomach, eat up all the bees. His empty stomach ate up all the bees. He flew back to the Turkish window again and said, cock a doodle doo Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkish Sultan was so mad he didn't know what to do. He called his three fat servants. What shall I do with this little rooster? The first fat servant said, hang him on the flagpole. The second fat servant said, cut his head off. And the third fat servant said, sit on him. The Turkish Sultan cried, that's it. I'll sit on him. Catch the little rooster and bring him to me. The three fat servants caught the little rooster and brought him to the Turkish Sultan. The Turkish Sultan opened the wide, wide bag of his trousers and put the little rooster in, and then he sat on him. But the rooster cried, Come, my full stomach, let out all the bees to sting the Turkish Sultan. So his full stomach let out all the bees. And did they sting the Turkish Sultan? They did. The Turkish Sultan jumped up in the air. Ouch, ouch, ow, ow, he cried. Take this little rooster to my treasure chamber and let him find his confounded diamond button. The three servants took the little rooster to the treasure chamber. Find your confounded diamond button, they said, and left him. But the little rooster cried, Come, my empty stomach, come, my empty stomach, eat up all the money. His empty stomach ate up all the money in the Turkish Sultan's treasure chamber. Then the little rooster waddled home as fast as he could and gave all the money to his poor old mistress. Then he went out in the yard to tell his friends, the bugs and the worms, about the Turkish Sultan and the diamond button. Oh, giggled Kate, tell us another funny story, Auntie, please. Wait, said Jancy, I think I heard something just now. It sounded like thunder. It is thunder, cried Father, as another low rumble came. They jumped up and ran out to the yard. Heavy clouds were gathering above, blotting out the stars. The leaves of the apple tree began to whisper as the wind came up. The thunder grew louder and there was crash of lightning. A gust of moist, cool wind whipped dust and stray leaves high in the air, bringing the fresh smell of rain with it. A storm, it'll rain, father, it will rain, cried Jancy. Oh, please let it rain, he whispered then, looking at the lowering clouds. A heavy, big drop fell on his upturned face. Rain, it does rain. The storm was upon them in a minute. The branches of the apple tree creaked and swayed in the howling wind. More and more drops fell, leaving big round holes on the dusty ground. Flashes of lightning came so fast it was almost as bright as the daylight. Thunder roared continuously, shaking the very ground. Rain, come rain, cried Jancy, bracing himself against the heavy wind. And the rain came. It came down in sheets, 
torrents of cool, fresh rain. They were soaked to the skin, but didn't think of going inside. Father stood very still, his face turned to the clouds, his outstretched arms welcoming the storm. Mother was the first one to think of common sense. She sneezed once, twice. My goodness, just look at the four of us, great big sillies we are. Come in, children, come in, Father. It will keep on raining now without your catching your death of cold. <clears throat> Could you? came a sneeze from Kate. There you go, inside with you, quick now. Ooh, I am wet, said Jancy, shaking himself like a puppy, splattering water all over the kitchen. As they walked, their boots made clucking little noises, leaving rivulets of water on the floor. Indeed, we are wet. The very idea. Hurry up, put some dry clothes on, all of you. Yes, you too, father, you great big baby. Go on now, no back talk. She laughed as he shook his head. I'll have to be the one to nurse you if you come down with a cold and I'll make some hot milk and honey as soon as I get something dry. They came back to the kitchen carrying wet clothes. Just throw those things on the porch, said Mother. I'll wash them tomorrow. We'll have water now, thank the Lord. The storm passed, but the rain didn't stop. It poured down steadily, making a silky whispering sound. The keen, fresh smell of wet earth came in through the open door. Mother spread the table with the, gray, the gayest red and white checked cloth. She lighted three candles and took the new flowery mugs off the shelf. Kate clapped her hands. It looks like a party. They drank the hot milk and honey and went to sleep later to the lullaby of distant thunder and the gurgle of water in the swelling brook. It rained for three whole days. When the sun came out again, every leaf, every blade of grass was a freshly washed, glistening emerald green. Little pink and yellow buds peeked out of their tight green coats promising to burst into bloom any minute. Wild strawberries were so plentiful, Kate and Jancy could eat all they wanted without moving from one spot. Mother made jam and preserves, storing the jars in the dairy. One morning, Father asked, Can you spare the farm hands for a day, Mother? I'm riding to the river to see the wheat fields. The farm hands knew Mother. They didn't wait for her answer. They were already galloping towards the stables. They came back leading the three horses, Kate called to Mother. Listen, Annie. She knocked her heels together. There was a loud jingle. Hear my spurs? Jancy has his on too. Jingle them, Jancy. They walked up and down on the porch. Jingle, jingle, jingle went the spurs. What will we do today, Uncle Martin? Asked Kate on the way. There won't be much for you two to do unless you want to stay in the saddle all day. I thought I would leave you and Jancy by the river near the ferry, you know, because I'll have to ride from one field to the other. It's all pretty much the same. Just look at the fields of wheat and rye and talk about labor, harvest, weeds, bugs, and such things. What do you think? Could we ride back and forth on the ferry? Asked Kate. You could do that. I'll ask Gaza to let you ride all you want. Father went over with them to the other side of the river and talked to Gaza. Then they came back together on the comp. I'll be back by sundown, said Father, and rode off. Riding back and forth on the comp was fun for a while, but the novelty soon wore off. Let's stay with Gaza and talk to him, proposed Jancy. Tell you what, cried Kate, let's go swimming. Can you swim, Kate? Swim and dive too. I can stay underwater for the longest time. Can you? N no, admitted Jancy. I can splash around, but I can't swim. My horse can though, he added proudly. He swims like a fish. Well, you can watch then, or maybe I could teach you, offered Kate. Maybe. I'll bring the horses down to the water. They like to go in, said Jancy. He walked to the horses and led them to the river's edge. Kate slipped off her clothes and boots and then ran to the shallow water. Come in, Jancy, it isn't deep. It's just so nice and warm. Jancy tugged at his boots, watching Kate enviously. She went farther and farther in and then she began to swim. He rolled up his pants and unbuttoned his shirt. Kate disappeared. Jancy looked up and down and he began to get frightened. Then Kate bobbed up almost in the middle of the river. Ooh, it's real deep out here. I can't touch the bottom, she cried. Come back, Kate. Don't go further in. The current is awful strong, yelled Jancy. He was very uneasy about this swimming business anyway. They hadn't even asked father. Kate laughed, sissy, and dove under the water again. When she came up, she was still further out where the strong current made a crest on the water. It tore her away, carrying her swiftly downstream. Hey, she cried once, then help. Help! It's taking me away! Jancy was desperate. He shouted at the approaching comp, and he saw men pointing to Kate, and they saw her too. But
but they'd never reach her. A thought struck him, and he was on his horse like lightning. Come on, Barsoni. Barsoni plunged and then began to swim powerfully towards Kate. The current caught him too, but he was steady. Jancy clung to him, watching Kate's bobbing head. I'm coming, Kate, he shouted. He was gaining fast. Now he could see her pale face and frightened eyes. When Barsoni was close to Kate, Jancy reached out and grabbed her. She clung to his arm, almost pulling him off the horse. Grab my leg and pull up, Kate. He helped her scramble up behind him and felt her arms clutch his waist. He turned his attention to the horse, pulling his head towards the shore. Good old Barsoni. The horse was exerting all his strength to get free of the current. Soon they were swimming in quiet water and then wading up into the shallow shore. Men came running. There was Geza, looking white as a sheet. Jancy stopped the horse and helped Kate off. She was still very pale and trembled like a leaf. She managed a wan smile. Thank you, Jancy, she stuttered. I, I, didn't, I didn't know a current could be so strong. People were all around them now. Geza threw his coat around Kate. What will Mr. Nagee say? He told me to keep an eye on you. What will he say? A man clapped Jancy on the shoulder. Great work, son. You saved the girl's life. He's my cousin, said Kate proudly, in spite of her chattering teeth. Long after the other men went on their way and Kate was dressed in her old self again, poor Geza lamented. What will Mr. Nagee say? Then he turned to them hopefully. Do we have to tell him? Your clothes are dry. There's nothing to give you away. Kate was watching the road all this time, thinking the same thing. What will he say? And mostly, what will he do? Now she shook her head. I guess we'll have to tell him, she sighed. Father came just before sundown. Well, children, did you have a good time? Nobody answered. Geza had deserted them, taking his worries across the river just before father arrived. Well, what happened? Kate, you're as pale as a ghost. And you, Chancy? What in the world is the matter with you? Kate took a deep, deep breath. <sighs> I went swimming and got into the current and almost drowned. And Jancy came after me on Barsoni and saved me and it was my fault. She managed to blurt out everything before she lost her courage. Father looked at them seriously. Tell me just how it happened. They told him everything. Kate finished the story. Jancy saved me. The man said so too. He said, great work, son. You saved the girl's life. I told them he is my cousin. Jancy stepped forward. Don't be angry, father. She can swim like anything, but she didn't know about the current. I'm not angry, son. I'm thankful that nothing serious happened to Kate, and I'm proud of you. She was foolish to venture into strange water alone, no matter how well she can swim. But from now on, you'll know better, won't you, Kate? She nodded her head solemnly. Well then, let's go home. And mind, not a word about this to mother. She would put both of you to bed for a week, he laughed. Come on, rascals, get on your horses. Kate turned to Jancy and whispered, He won't spank me? Nah, he never does that unless you're just awful bad. He is my father.